Welcome to Real Money Talks. Real strategies from the money makers and the world changers that you can use to make millions, keep those millions, multiply your wealth, and build your team. Here's your host, author of five New York Times bestsellers, money expert on Dr. Phil, CNN, CNBC, The Street TV, Fox News, and The View, Laurel Langmire. Hi, this is Laurel. Welcome back to Laurel's Real Money Talks, a podcast that we talk about how to make money, how to keep it, how to invest it, why you need a team. And there is so much to learn, the volatile economy that we are in. You know, never before, as I've said on many podcasts, has the world been shut down. I mean, World War One, Two. There's, there's nowhere. There's nowhere that anything has ever come close to what this coronavirus has done to our world economy, our local economy, and really just, I mean, the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is struggling, and uh, as you know, we love the heart of an entrepreneur. So, with me today, I have Joey Gilbert. He's a local lawyer here in Reno, Nevada. Has a huge voice and love for not only Nevadans, entrepreneurs have been following world leaders around this coronavirus. We're not going to just make it about the coronavirus and politics. So we really want to talk about the true economics and what it has done to our families, our elderly, our kids. I mean, I have a 14 and 21 year old. My 21 year old is not having a great college experience, although he's loving playing football. It's pretty rough out there. So Joy Gilbert, welcome to Laurel's World Money Talks. Thanks for having me on, Laurel. I really appreciate it. It's fun to be with you, and I'm honored to be a part of this podcast. Thank you, and I look forward to doing more with you. I love how you think about things. I saw Joey. First of all, Joey's team has been our uh, local marijuana lawyer here in Nevada on some of our projects, so has uh, been deeply in that industry. And uh, what I love is how thorough you get, you know, when you're not just a lawyer that kind of skims across the top, like your team rolled up their sleeves and really did the work for us. So we appreciate that. And then because of that, you know, we've following you and recently you did a Facebook post and I thought, oh my gosh, I have to have you on to talk about just the, the data and the, the seriousness of what is really happening to our economy and the entrepreneurs around the world. Uh, before we do that, though, I just want to talk a little bit about you won the money belt as a world ranked fighter. So talk a little bit about, I mean, you learn the hard way of financial planning, understand tax management, promotion fees, not only, you know, has anybody that's walked through the Reno airport, they know you, right? You uh, risk billboards, you're the big guy with your fists out, you know, rings on and talk a little bit about your background. Well, you know, it's funny you say that I am, uh, I am very proud of my background being a fighter. I used to tell people, you know, there's no difference between being a lawyer and, and boxing because you're still fighting people for money. But, um, <laughs> you know, boom, 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 boom. but I definitely am one of those guys that goes down the rabbit hole. I don't attach myself to an issue and then just, you know, skim it. You know, just like you mentioned with marijuana, um, I'm one of the you know few Republicans that from the beginning was looking at were looking. At, and I say that because it was a it was a very controversial political issue. And I've been one of those guys that I think has been leading it and saying, like, look, there's a lot we can do here, not just on a business standpoint and improving communities, but also criminal justice reform and getting, you know, there's no way you should be sitting in prison doing life in prison for the same amount of basically concentrated cannabis that you can purchase down now at the store. And we, we need to do something about that. It's my opinion. So yep. I kind of looked at cannabis from a couple of different angles, thinking like, how could I help here and what, what could I do more? And then that entrepreneur cap goes on and then I start figuring out different ways. So not only was the law firm and it's compliance section, then it's, you know, how it can help with, you know, getting people, um, you know, their, their branding and, you know, how they can use it. You know, there's just a lot, you know, with two, two eighty e the tax code and getting creative. There was just so many things that I saw, you know, in front of me, I needed to, to learn and educate myself on, which I did. And like I said earlier, I now have the, one of the greatest groups. I work with my friend Kira Sears, but Ed Humphrey and his group, Humphrey Law, they're fantastic. So it's been really a blessing. And then I took that same diligence and skill and the tenacity I took into the boxing room, into the, into the courtroom. And now, you know, let's fast forward to the coronavirus it's yeah. like, I'm going to understand an issue. I'm going to understand an issue. I didn't charge the doctor's group, uh, Nevada Osteopathic Medical Association. I didn't charge, I didn't build one hour against it. And I probably put in a few thousand hours because in order to get at this level, you've got to educate yourself. So I spent literally hours on Facebook and YouTube yeah. and Google and just everything, reading, learning. And once I felt I had a, a grasp of the information, I don't, I don't want to say grasp. I really do feel like I could go against any expert in epidemiology or, or anything, you know, and an oncologist and really give them, you know, a lesson. 
because it was that important. I mean, my parents got it, you know, we've had, you know, together, I can only imagine the kind of calls you've gotten, but virtually everybody business owner in the state, Joey helped me please. And I couldn't do anything about it because of the governor's proclamation. So I got in the nitty gritty. I understand it. And I'm happy to now take that fight forward for Nevadans. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's just talk in the broad scheme, right? March, I'll never forget the March 6th and 7th. I was in Houston speaking at an event. On my way home, 15 events canceled. And uh, it was very clear that the world was going to shut down. I think most people thought it was going to be 30, 60 days. So I, you know, like you got to the playing field and we started doing broadcasts for anybody with any money question, any business question. How can we help you? This is what you should do. This is what you should avoid doing. And, you know, really, really got in there. And here we are months and months and months and months later. You, like I say, you know, I always, I always show people my little business card, right? That, you know, we're not participating. It's a wrap. <laughs> we're over it. It's time to move on. It's been yep. seven months. Like, I mean, it was 15 days to slow the spread. We're on seven months. It was all about the overwhelming of the healthcare and hospital system, which didn't happen, which can't happen, which won't happen. So can we please turn the page and get on with our lives and protect the vulnerable, let our kids go back in school? And that's where I'm at. I've just had it. I'm with you. So um, you have the data. Um, I so enjoyed it. So hate to have to repeat your Facebook uh, post and the diligence you did, but let's begin there. So there's the Great Behringer Declaration. There's World Health Organization. There's the CDC. Give it to it the way you have seen it and uh, what you think needs to happen. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because I you have to go to other news medias to get this information. So I have to go to Australian news because you don't see this on our mainstream news. You don't see that coronavirus, the WHO backflips on virus stance. World Health Organization advocates lockdowns are not Good. They basically go to say it's the worst thing we could have done. And again, here's another one. BBC coronavirus experts, you know, all saying that, you know, join global anti-lockdown movement. So here it is. It's not me saying this. And I get so frustrated because people want to say things. This isn't a Republican issue. This isn't a Democrat issue. This is like this is the United States of America. We're a free society. You can't lock us in our homes and tell us to shut our businesses. And now the people that you were calling gospel, the who, every a couple months ago, anything these guys said, we had to listen to. Well, here they are saying it, that they shouldn't be doing lockdowns. So unless there's a new novel coronavirus that's only in Nevada and California, how are Utah and Idaho? These states have had full sports since August. There's no mass death. There's no overrunning of the hospitals any more so than any time this time of year for the last 20 years. I can we can get into that stuff. Yeah. So I basically look at this like the data that everyone wants to say. What does our governor say? The data. We're going to do stuff and we're going to follow the data, 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 data. I'm tired of hearing about the data. But then we get something out of here we go. Stats hold. What does this one say that surprise lockdowns may have had very little effect on COVID-19. So, you know, data after data. Research after you know research study comes out, and they've said now that exactly what we're doing is no longer good. And then you did bring up this. This is the Great Barrington Declaration. This is a really unique document because if you look at this, they go on to here to say at the time it was uh, six thousand. Now it's up over twelve thousand and climbing. Experts in public health, epidemiology, and signed by doctors, not doctors that teach but doctors that are actually in the trenches treating coronavirus patients, not theory, not PhDs at some university, no doctors in the field saying this works and this is, you know, what we've been doing is bad. So again, everyone said now that they're more worried about the mental and health impacts of the result of the coronavirus lockdowns and shutdowns of our economy versus the actual coronavirus itself. And just to put it in perspective, yeah. they are now forecasting that close to 100 million, I'm going to say it again, 100 million are facing poverty and starvation across the world because of the coronavirus lockdowns that are still in effect in some places, yeah. despite the fact that it's been proven now that we can no longer lock people down. Yeah, I mean, I'm married to a Canadian. I speak to it a lot. I'm, I can't even go across the border to see my in-laws. Australia, I mean, we have enormous client base in Australia. They're locked down even between their own states. 
right? So if you have business between Sydney and Melbourne, you can't go back and forth. Some of the lockdowns have become so severe. So do you think it's politics? Do you, I mean, we know that at some level it is. I mean, but why is the world um, following uh, before we come to the United States and we're going to come close to Nevada? Why do you think the world's following at such an, I'm going to say odd level? I mean, they actually have less deaths. I watch, you know, the the province my husband's from, and they went back. They shut down bars this last weekend. They went back to, you know, delivery. And I mean, they're almost back in what they're calling stage one. Why do you yeah. think the international space is reacting in such a severe manner? Well, internationally, I think that there's certain countries that, you know, got it wrong and just haven't been willing to admit that they got it wrong. But where I think a lot of the problems are just in misinformation, disinformation, There are going to be tens of millions of people starving throughout the continent of Africa based on bad information when Africa, believe it or not, has some of the lowest COVID-19 infection rates. And why is that? Well, I'll share with everybody, but malaria is kind of a big issue in Africa. And I don't know that. Well, first of all, my father was deployed there. And what is the first thing they put him on when he went over there? Well, they put him on hydroxychloroquine, uh, anti-malaria drug. And so far, there's been millions of DOD personnel on hydroxychloroquine. And in fact, Dr. Jim Forsythe here in town was a colonel back in 1970 in Saigon and set up the laboratory. At that time, all 523,000 American GIs that went through Saigon were on hydroxychloroquine. And according to him, guess how many GIs they sent home for a heart problem or for any medical complications that were caused by hydroxychloroquine, a big fat goose egg. So um, there's a lot of scare tactics going on because again, like I said, You've got countries like Angola and places there that have had less than a few dozen, you know, deaths from this, yet they've shut down their borders and are not letting food and supplies. And because of COVID, when again, um, majority of people, meaning 99 percent of the people that even get it will survive. But then even 96 percent of even in the highest, you know, could even fall susceptible to becoming very ill or dying from it. So, again, it's just been blown completely out of proportion. But to answer one of your questions You can tell me what you think about this with regards to politics. I want to do two things for you. This I showed you before. This is a map of Hillary Clinton's victory back in 2016. And you can see those are the states that she won. And so if this is not political, I'm now going to show you these are the states in the United States where college, youth, and high school sports are permitted. And the dark states are where they're not permitted. Those are the states still locked down in the heaviest restrictions economies closed, highest mask mandates, everything else, and they're hurting our children. So I don't know if that looks political to you, but it sure looks a little suspect to me. So again, and I'll, and I'll share with you, as you know, I put together a document where I compared side by side 84 million total in red states out of 84 million, and then I compared it to blue states with a total population of 83 million. And this is kind of interesting because with 84 million, the total cases was 2,300,000 in the red states. And the cases was about 1.7 million in the blue states. This was despite all the lockdowns. And this is where Dr. Scott Atlas, who's now the president's advisor, was talking about herd immunity. And had we done what we should have done with Sweden and Denmark and other countries did back in May, which was, yes, keep certain protocols in place for where you're preparing food and wiping down areas and whatnot, but no restrictions except for those who we need to protect. So what I would have done, I would have sent the National Guard to all our nursing homes, critical care facilities, senior facilities, and just had them watch protocol, PPE, make sure doctors that weren't going, because what was happening, they found out, was doctors that were making rounds at multiple nursing homes and nurses from multiple nursing homes were infecting everybody. And so they should have immediately, you know, put these people on medication. They didn't do that. But just to share with you, the blue states, same population, and obviously much more locked down. But we had a death rate of 4.6% in the blue states versus 1.7% in the red states. At the same time, we've got mask mandates, the highest restrictions in the blue states, yeah. no masks in some of these red states. And again, the same infection rate, except a little higher in the red states. Obviously, they don't have all the the same things, but we know who's going to get it. But what was crazy was the death totals. The death totals in the blue states was about, um, excuse me, in the red states was 43,000. And the death totals in the blue states was 74,000. Same amount of population. 
Yeah. So almost double the death. And why is that? Because you've got these people restricted. You've got them wearing masks. A lot of them were foregoing regular, normal medical procedures, elective procedures, elective checkups. So again, this is this takes us into one more thing. And again, I, I don't want to bother people if I don't have data. But here's something I printed out. This was what was killing Nevadans. OK, what's killing Nevadans? Suicide yep. cancer among top 10 causes in the silver state. Right. So I printed this out from 2019. Now, why this is funny is because if you flip to the back page, this is like the financials, any prospectus, doesn't matter how much fluff you are, they flip to the back page, they get to the numbers. The three main things for, or for death or for in Nevada was stroke, chronic lower respiratory disease, cancer, and disease of the heart. But shockingly, in 2020, either word, the coronavirus has now cured stroke, respiratory disease, cancer, and heart disease, or... They're labeling those things COVID. We know there's that. no way to explain it because there's almost like a six, seven, eight hundred person difference in these things. So either these people died of cancer and also had COVID, or they just got labeled COVID. I haven't figured this out yet. I'm not done. I'm actually foiling the hospitals for the information, and I'm going to get it. But I think I'm going to be um, not surprised as yeah. a lot of other people because I've got administrators and nurses and really cool people from these hospitals sending me stuff that I can't use just yet. I have to wait to get it foiled. But if these tear sheets they're sending me even remotely line up with the real data, there's going to be a lot of explaining to do because it shows that Nevada fell off a cliff at the end of May. We should have been open full, not, not 50%, not 75%, 100% since June. And to do otherwise has been, I think, a criminal, unconscionable act. It should not be stood forever. And we need to figure out how to never let it happen again. That's that's how bad it is. No, I, I totally agree. And two things, two comments on that. I mean, the the coding and we've seen it and clearly again without facts, you know, the hospitals are getting paid. I'm curious if you actually know who's paying them to code it. They're actually COVID. getting paid through the federal coronavirus relief packages that they ushered in right away that actually, if you go back, it's the craziest stuff was was actually being brought to the floor and voted on before the coronavirus even hit. This whole thing is just doesn't smell right. It's really yeah. scary. And then as we're now finding out one at a time, I don't know if you know this, but in Michigan, the Supreme Court there found that the coronavirus lockdowns were violating their constitution. I love that. They got all thrown out. One other thing I want to show everybody, which is very important, is a CDC study from September of this year. Look at this. So our own CDC found evidence that most who contracted the coronavirus frequently wore masks. I've never worn a mask. But now they're showing that the constant touching of everything, they now know it's not aerosized. How do we know this? Well, you like me probably have to fly places. I've been on airplanes, you know, this entire time. Yep. So you tell me this then. If this virus is the deadliest virus of our lifetime and it's airborne and we need to wear masks to prevent ourselves, then please just, I will go away where I can stop this podcast right now. Please explain to me then how on a five hour flight to Miami, they allow you to take off your mask when you're eating or drinking. And if you're in first class, I didn't wear a mask, nor did anybody else the entire time. Me either. We cycle there. The pilots are breathing the same air we are. The entire plane is. So either that entire plane's now got Corona or it's not exactly doing what they're trying to scare everybody into thinking they're doing. So that's all I say to you. And again, if the people most likely to contract it are the ones wearing the mask, then that just proves something that science tells you. It's too small of a particle size for the mask to stop anyway. People aren't wearing the mask right. And outside of a healthcare setting, and this is per Emperor Fauci, Dr. Fauci came on in April and May and said, should not be wearing masks out and about. And only if you're in a place where you can't socially distance and you're around sick people, should you mean a healthcare setting. So again, guys, you can't flip flop four times. First, you need masks then you don't need masks. Then it's airborne. Then it's not airborne. I just have taken a, a holistic approach. I've gotten lots of sunlight. I've eaten very healthy. I've upped my vitamin D, vitamin C and zinc, as have all the people close to me. And no one's gotten this. So I just think, you know, we need to get past this nonsense and it is political. Unfortunately, I think it's both sides, though. I think big pharma, I think, you know, there's a lot of money to be made whenever there's money to be made. 
hospital stocks, and they got all this money allocated to them so so long as there was this crazy corona response right. needed. Right. That's why they built beds out. You know, Donald Trump spent over seven hundred million dollars building field hospitals throughout greater New York and greater yep. New Jersey, and they didn't put one patient in them. But we are still closed down, and those states are still closed down because they don't want the hospitals or the healthcare facility to be maxed and reach capacity. So something just isn't lining up. None of it lines up. I mean, all of a sudden we don't have a flu, but we have Corona. I mean, all of the real sicknesses are not being, which is really sad. I mean, 2020 is just going to be a write-off of any historical norms because there aren't any norms. Let's talk before we, I want to move to economics in a moment and the economics of the entrepreneurs that are getting just pummeled in this. But what do you think about the vaccine? From what I heard, I think you and I are very uh, aligned that there are therapeutics we know that can handle this without any big vaccine and uh, the agenda of that. Well, you know who wants the vaccine, right? Obviously, are the vaccine companies, but have you ever seen any of those people in their car by themselves wearing a mask? Yep. No, never. But that's who wants the vaccine. These people, and God bless them. I love them. Some of them are my friends, but they have been terrorized to death by our media. You put on CNN... And you want to talk about irresponsible. All they do is run a toll count of infections of the crime. That would be like you and me calling each other every day about who's got the flu. Oh, my God, Joey, did you hear who got the flu? Because I'm sorry, but it's just as deadly as the mortality rate for everyone else, unless you're 70 or above with an obesity or diabetes problem or comorbidity of serious nature. It doesn't even matter. Like we shouldn't even be talking about it. But. Every night on the ticker tape, they're showing the pot. And it's just like, what are you doing? You know, so they've scared people half to death. Yep. And so those people, and I actually have had come across a couple of these that I've gotten out of their basements, that I've gotten back to work because someone told me about it. And I called them up and said, are you out of your mind? Get up here. And I made these people come up and meet with me and sat there with them and explained all the different therapeutics and what they're doing. And I watched them go like literally the stress and pain drained from their face. They went back to work. They're now working. They couldn't believe they were held up in their house for the better part of four months mm-hmm. thinking that they had to wait for this vaccine. So now I will say this, Donald Trump, whether you love him or hate him, there's going to be plenty of your listeners that hate him. But let me just tell you this. The guy is not exactly the pinnacle of health. He eats McDonald's. He drinks Diet Cokes. He lives off cheeseburgers. He's yep. 74 years old. He's slightly overweight. We'll say that according to Nancy Pelosi. He's obese morbidly obese. I love their their little exchanges. But if that man could beat that in four days, and I understand he got Regeneron, but he was on vitamin D, zinc. I know he was taking hydroxychloroquine early and he got through it. And the remdesivir is BS and every trial shows it. It doesn't do a fraction of what the known therapeutics we do. But here's the most important thing for the listeners at home, people that are scared about this, When it initially came out in March and April, everyone was scared to death, rightfully so. We thought it was an ARD scenario, a classic acute respiratory deficiency syndrome. So they were treating people completely wrong. What do I mean by that? They thought that this was an oxygen problem at the lungs. So they are high high pressure ventilating and blowing their lungs out, didn't understand what was going on. Then they realized what corona actually did, which was shut down the air exchange between the hemoglobin and the little sacs, the little VLI. We can get a little into the weeds, but everyone knows that air comes into the lungs. There's an exchange that takes place. Right. Well, there was no exchange taking place, right? Because the coronavirus shuts down that exchange. Well, what they figured out was that by giving the body a little time, the immune system time to catch up, getting oxygen and not high pressurizing and treating this, that they were able to, the whether it was vitamin C, whether it was zinc, whether it was other therapeutics, they found out that it was a thrombosis. It was actually, you know, blood clotting. And so once they started attacking it from a different angle, death dropped in half. Now they've got it down to even less than that. Like if you die from Corona, um, you either waited far too long to get in there or you're in one of these parts of the country where they're still in denial and they didn't use some of the things that they now know to use. So Again, it was hit wrong. You know, we've learned so much. The president's so right. This should not dominate anybody's lives. There are known treatments, medications, and therapeutics that are working yep. wonderfully. You don't need a vaccine. I think that the rushing of a vaccine, and if you want to take it, same thing goes. If you want to take it, take it. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you want to stay in your house till this time next year, be my guest. But if you want to live life, You should be able to go out there. I'm just scared to death that they're going to do some nonsense like you can't fly or you can't stay in this hotel unless you have this vaccine. And 
then here come the attorneys and you're going to be, everyone's going to be loving me because I'm way ahead and I'll be launching the lawsuits because I'm not taking this vaccine for something that's 99.9% curable and treatable for someone. Yeah. My, and then if you mac, uh, take up into healthy individuals, my age that eat clean and take vitamins, like this thing can't do anything to me. Right. Like I'm trying to find a coronavirus patient so I can lick them, get it, prove to everybody that it's good and be done with it. I agree. I agree. No, I mean, I'm not scared of it. So no, well, and I'm glad I'll be right on your doorstep and supporting you, uh, which is what I told you before the broadcast is uh, we're going to come to uh, what we're going to do to uh, take Nevada back in a moment. Let's talk about the economics, though. I mean, 2020, I'll back up 2020 came in and I'm thinking this could be a great transition year. My son's playing, you know, division one uh, football. I want to go to Georgia, watch him play. And oh, I'm gonna Georgia. Chill. So that's why. They never shut down. They never shut down anything. They've had it. And actually, with almost 11 million people start started to jump in there, they've got less than 8,000 deaths, 11 million people. We have 3 million people, 2,000 deaths. They never shut down. And isn't it kind of odd that the CDC is headquartered in Georgia? Isn't it? I yeah, but they've got four big football teams. None of them shut down. Uh, yeah. You know, Georgia State, Georgia University. He plays for Georgia Southern and Georgia Tech. He got four big teams. None of them. They took precautions. They were on, way out on the edge. But my point was in 2020, you know, I came into this thinking, I'm going to transition a little and go play mom. And hell, then March happened. I've never been so active with entrepreneurs who are suffering and they don't know Mar just from Mark marketing strategies, sales strategies. I'm a stage speaker. This is my new stage, you know, being on these Zooms. Um, so a lot of them didn't have the agility, though, to change the business model. So every day, Joey, we are working with businesses to keep them alive, get them capital, you know, strategize. I wouldn't even know. I mean, I don't know if you know the statistics, but I mean, what is the economic devastation to the entrepreneurs in the United States? If you just had a rough guess, I, I wouldn't even know how to to guess it because you've got oh, no, so I mean, many. I think I've got a pretty good pulse on it. I mean, you know, we're one of the three states in the nation that's the highest unemployment. You know, Nevada, California, and believe it or not, Hawaii. We're also the three states with the most severe uh, and strictest lockdowns. You know, why is that? You know, we have lost, you know, almost hundreds of thousands of jobs here now. Um, and the small businesses, like they said, according to Yelp's reviews and Yelp's information, and they're, they're actually kind of a good indicator, you know, a third of the small businesses are going to be shut down. I mean, one third of your of the small businesses in your town will not make it through this. They're still holding on, but the studies are showing they're never going to recover and they're yeah. going to shut down. And again, you know, how heartbreaking is that? to these people or to, to friends of ours and to entrepreneurs that worked their whole lives to build this, when they got to watch these big box stores stay open, you know, the Home Depots and the Walmarts and the grocery chains. And so something just never smelled right. Like, so is the Corona, it just, it, it knows Walmart versus in the casinos versus the mom and pop bars and taverns. Like, I'm just not understanding this. So there was yeah. definitely some done here that was major. And I do think that there's going to be about a third of our small business friends that are either going to have to close that business, open another one, go somewhere else, ride it out a couple of years. But even still in this state with what this governor has done, and we lost it big because of all of our trade shows and conventions, people just picked other places. And that's not coming. We already lost the NFR. We already lost big, big deals that probably won't come back again with some of the stuff they're ushering in. I don't know how they're going to get them back with states like Texas and South Dakota that did such, you know, very innovative things to get to welcome people in that it's going to be a tough one. So I think the economic picture across the, the states is dire. And I don't even think we're really going to see the true repercussions for another few months. I think this time next year, it'll really be evident because people are still holding on. You know, they're still, you know, with a hope and a prayer, they burn through everything. Unless the election happens and we're snapped right back, which I don't foresee happening in these select blue states, they're not going to make it out. Yeah. So what's the possibility of doing for Nevada what Michigan did, which is take it to the state Supreme Court and have it overruled and have the governor overruled? You know, we're both I'll just publicly say it to lead the conversation. We're not fans. You know, every promise he made, especially the marijuana industry, that's where I got introduced at a marijuana conference in Las Vegas to Sisolak. And uh, everybody thought he was amazing. He made all these promises and we get, of course, done nothing but follow Gal you know, follow Newsom and his. You yeah, know, as a matter of fact, his actually head in charge, his Caleb Cage guy is such a clown that all he does is call Sacramento for advisement. I mean, that's all they've done this entire time. Nothing has been originated here in the state. They call California for what to do. They follow it as much as they can without, you know, 
they've still got to take into account rural parts of the state that are, I mean, we're going to go anyway. We're going to open anyway. And some of them have, and they all should. I mean, let's be frank. All of Nevada should just open. They should all throw their masks out because Florida has now been open for more than a few weeks. There's not mass death. The hospitals aren't overcrowded. The same thing would happen here. And I think that'd be the simplest way to solve it because you'd never put that genie back in the bottle. But Sisolak has been the worst. I say WGE, worst governor ever, hashtag worst governor ever. I look at his press conferences as someone that's just like taking a, a whiz into the wind and it just blows back on him because everything he says is just insanity. It, there's no direction. There's no guidance. There's been no coordinated plan. And I don't care what anyone says. On day one, I would have had a two-week plan. First of all, I wouldn't have shut anything down. I would have had a two-week plan for everything. I would have had all our you know, nursing homes, critical care facilities, dosed. Sure, right to try. Here you go. Sign your waiver. Take what you want to take. And given everybody that option to treat this like how they want to treat it like adults. But you say, you know, you bring up economy. Here's something I just printed up. This will show you what's the most important to voters right now. And you see the top is the economy. You know, you see the coronavirus response down there a little bit. But if you see the first thing is economy, health care, Supreme Court outbreak, violent crime, foreign policy, gun policy. That's what's important to, to Americans right now is the economy. Everybody wants this economy open. And I think all people now are kind of, but but for those few, all yep. see the writing on the wall and know that there's some nonsense going on because they're looking at a neighboring state saying, well, hold on a second. You know, I've got friends in this stuff. They're not wearing masks. No one's dying. Like, why are we still locked down? It's interesting. Yeah. Well, and uh, as far as lawsuits, too, I mean, from a legal perspective, I mean, what what civil liberties and lawsuits can be filed well, I've filed everything I can. I've lost all of them. I've never been pounded on so worse in court in my life. I've never lost. I mean, it's just been one political decision after another. I mean, it, it's been ridiculous. And again, you know, we sued to open the small businesses. We sued for the churches. We sued for the hydroxychloroquine. And we're, we're taking the hydroxychloroquine to the Nevada Supreme Court. We're taking the church thing to the Ninth Circuit just because, just because, because at yeah. the end of the day, this should never happen again. But I'll tell you this much. If you want to know who, and, and I'm a very opinionated Trump person, I believe Trump is going to win in a landslide to the likes of which they've never seen. And I'll say the same thing and I'll say why. Yep. Well, number one is they have greatly overlooked what I call the sleeping giant. And that is our Hispanic uh, population, our Latino brothers and sisters, uh, half of which are not only my clients, but my best friends, law partner, I mean, partners, partners in all my other businesses. And I say this to people because you took the, one of the hardest working, uh, loyal, you know, go-getting, resilient demographics and you shut their businesses down. Then you stuffed their kids in their home. Then you told them mom can't work either. Then you took away their sports. And after all that, some of these people not only are working two jobs and have worked years to open up the second business that they finally got going. Not only did you shut that down and tell them they're not as important as Home Depot and the other contractors that are out there working, then you didn't let them go to church. OK, and I'm just telling you right now, remember where you heard it and you when they're all sitting there on election night, like with that look like what happened? Like, oh, my God. And the black community and the Hispanic community hand, hand them the greatest losses they've ever seen. It's because you deprive them of their right to work, their right to have their kids in school, their right to go to their churches. And you limited their, their freedoms and the freedoms of their kids. That is something that's resonating big time with people. And I think it's going to really show itself out in the next, you know, couple weeks. Um, the church lawsuit, I'm unaware of that one. Say a little bit about what what you did with that so one. We just believe that, you know, the churches were treated unfairly. Everybody else was given 50 percent capacity, but they were given they could only have 50 people in there. And it just made no sense. And still to this day, it makes zero sense. And it makes clear why, why would they do that? So the reason why we're appealing is, first of all, we believe there's an equal protection argument. We believe there's other things. But most importantly, it's capable of repetition. But who doesn't think for one second if Trump was to lose, you know, because of this mail in ballot nonsense and Biden gets into office and he tried to shut things down again, that they wouldn't go right back to it. So me being a fighter, I'm not giving up until I know for certain. And you don't ever leave it to the judges. And in this case, it would be election. I'm going to go get the victory if I can, or at yeah. least push. I might lose again, but I'm not going to not try because I think that's too important. I have seen the devastation, and I believe that churches are very important, just like our gyms are very important, and they yeah. shouldn't be closed down, at least not such to a degree that it's unfair and that they're closed down and they're restricted more than any other business. So I just don't think that's 
a fair Well, share. and they take an enormous financial hit. I mean, if, if people don't go to church, I mean, even though they're watching online, they're still typically, I, again, didn't do the research, but you could pretty much imagine the donations and the commitment to the church isn't there. You know, I live down the Gardner of Mendeville, uh, Gardnerville and Minden area, and there's churches being built that have slowed down because of the financial impact. Absolutely. So it is a business. And uh, I appreciate it's affecting that. everybody. And I think they, I do say this again and again. This is by design. This is not an accident. Anybody that thinks that this wasn't, you know, a selected, targeted thing. I mean, just read a little bit. Go on Google, you know, hit next a few times. Don't read what you first get served. You got to go deep a little bit or go on DuckDuckGo and you'll be alarmed at what you're reading and other outlets that aren't our mainstream news media. Because the problem here with Nevada and with, you know, just the United States in general now is that with AI and with a lot of algorithms, they're going to feed you what they think they want you to know. So what you're seeing when you do a Google search, if you're a CNN viewer, is going to be completely different than what I see as a Fox News or, you know, I like to get everything from all different papers, but it's going to be different. And so I think people are just scared and don't know really what's true and what's not true. But, you know, I'll, t- I'll show you this. You know, two things that are important for us are this one right here. This was that Trump health officials blasted you know, Nevada after the end of rapid use testing in our nursing homes. Why would we stop? And, and I'll share with you that we elected back in March not to get the rapid test. Yeah. OK, the, the one day or the 72 hour test. Why would we not with a state like Nevada with casinos on the line? I can promise you and you know, I'm right here that we could have made a phone call to our friends in the casinos and said, shut down or spring for these tests. And I could promise you to their bottom line number, a couple million bucks in tests would have been like this versus how long they've been shut down. And we could have done things differently, but we didn't. And so unfortunately, we're we're suffering stuff that we never should have suffered. Yeah, it's, it's, It's terrible. So, Joey, I'm going to be first to say, I mean, I told uh, Nancy when I first talked to her, I said, you know, when Syslac goes out, I hope you go in. So that's my uh, <laughs> I know you're not saying anything, but it'd be. Uh, I know what I'm telling people is I'm looking at it. I'm considering right. it be. But I'm the I mean, I am the furthest thing from a politician. You can already see. I will say what I need to say and I won't hold back. I love it. You know, bottom line is, you know, I, th- I think, though, that Nevadans would welcome that. I think they are so frustrated with what they just yeah. dealt with that they would rather have someone. And I would do it daily. Facebook live, like this is what's going down, you know, like it or not, here's where we're at. But here's one thing that's been cool is that the governor's coronavirus response has been tumbling. Voter support for Sisolak's coronavirus response tumbles. Well, yeah, no, no duh at all. I'll say I won't say anything mad, but of course it's, it's tumbling. But one last thing for your viewers, because this is so much fun. This is a little graph of Argentina. If you see here, this is in this is when they instituted the mask mandate. Look what happened once they started people marrying masks. How many people started catching the virus? It just escalated up. So this bottom number here is 1014, actually 1020. So you see what happened when they put in the mask mandate. So that would correlate with our own CDC saying that those that frequently wore masks, because I mean, let's talk about this real quick, guys. It's the same mask you've been wearing for days. You're pulling out of your pocket, purse, car. It's yeah. moist. It's been set down. You're touching everything, phone, door handles, steering wheel, carts, other products in the store. And then you're touching your face. Then you're wiping your eyes. And you're, it's just, it's, it's insanity. And so as my father has said, and I will just say this to everyone, if you want to prevent the coronavirus, wash your hands, use your hand sanitizer. If you're sick, stay home. And sanitize workstations or workspaces or places that you come into contact with. Outside of that, live your life. Yeah. Let your kids outside. Go about your business. If you have parents, older parents or older family members that you're concerned about, perhaps limit contact with them. But not so much because these people are dying from not having human contact. They're dying from their immune systems being thrown off so badly that they just spent seven months sitting inside. They missed the whole summer, summer, all the vitamin D, all the fresh air, all the love from their grandchildren. That's what's been hurting people the most. And those are the repercussions that the great Barrington Declaration are saying that we're going to experience for not the next couple months, the next couple years. Yeah. That is scary. Yeah, that is scary. Well, because you have to think, too, Joey, I mean, who has the training to take some of these, you know, kids? I mean, suicides on the highest uh, levels that we've ever seen. But the depression, the anxiety. I mean, I look at my son in school and they don't have to go to school. It's really a campus of athletes. Thank God that at least the athletes can go. 
but you know, we could go on about the whole university. I don't know how long, you know, some of these universities can keep their kids online and still require that tuition. The reason you send your kids to certain schools, the reason I sent, you know, Logan to certain schools is to meet other people and to meet those families of business school and finance school. You, I mean, it's a networking event and plus it's a disconnect. And from this, it's so required that these kids go out and be on campuses. So I have a huge voice about that. But I even changed schools here publicly in uh, in Nevada. I sent my daughter to a private school because I didn't buy into how they were going to do the public school. And the private schools did it. She's in normal school, doesn't wear a mask, goes to school, normal time. They do normal activities. But I fought with the school board here and they would not do anything about it. They said, this is the way it's going to be. I said, well, to the degree we lose, you're going to lose money from my daughter. And they said, do we have to do? So I did. I left and I went to private school. And just so you know, I did the same thing with my niece. I was here last uh, April and May, and I had to finish that insanity that they call distance learning, and they were all failing, and I have the resources, fortunately. I now have seven kids homeschooling here every day, and my niece going to a private school, but I had to think quickly, come up with solutions. It's absolutely insane, and again, they're missing. The one thing I think they keep saying in this great Barrington Declaration and other people is that they never get their youth back. Okay, so what you've done to these kids has just been so dishonest and so unconscionable when you think about it. First of all, they're the least likely to be infected. Europe has now proven there's not one documented student to teacher infection in the modern world. They're not transmitters. It's just all nonsense. Then you get these teachers that are actually holding up signs saying, don't murder me. Like, I mean, I just wanted to take that teacher and put her in the therapy she needs, get her on the meds she needs. Because how do you then explain to the healthcare workers and the grocery clerks and the people at the gas? I mean, everywhere else, what are you? Sorry, are, are we trying to murder them? Like, it's just, it just got out of control. And it's not fair that the kids even had to see it. I had to tell my daughter, you know, first of all, the last person you want to get in an argument with is my 10 year old daughter. She'll give you a lecture on the mass. She'll give you a lecture on the coronavirus mortality rate. She'll give you a, a lecture on the restrictions, how nonsense they are. But again, that's informed people. And I just think that if people just did a little of their homework, don't believe me, don't believe you, don't go on Fox, just get on a computer, it's free, the internet is free, go on Google, and this is how I found this out, you'll get a kick out of this. I'm watching Fox Business late one night, and I see Trump stopping all travel from China. And we're in the middle of a trade agreement, I, I'm there, and I'm like, I lean up like, wait, what? Like, what's going on? What is it? What is he doing? Right. right. First of all, I'm a huge fan of the president, but there are definitely things this will shock everybody. He does or says that sometimes I don't agree with. And there's days I want to crawl under my desk and be like, what? Why did you say that? Did you have to say that? But yep. so it's one of those things where I'm like, OK, suspending travel from China. So I quickly type in. I find this coronavirus. I start to look at like, so Shanghai has got to be shut down. Nope, it's not. I start looking at surrounding countries. Then I type in this. Here's my search query. Coronavirus treatment, South Korea. That's what I typed in. Boom, pops up. They're treating all healthcare workers, all high risk people with hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, and zinc sulfate for five days. Do you know how many deaths they have in the entire nation of South Korea? Just take a guess. None. 500. Less than 500 in the entire nation state of South Korea. Okay. And again, these are people 93. So anyway, I looked at that. I quickly called my father, told him, hey, we need to get our hands on this stuff. Then within like two days, our governor bans it. And I'm going, I'm scratching my head. Like he could have done the same thing I did. Like did his coronavirus task force, like do a Google search. And so that's where I've been since March 23rd, like in shock. I'm yep. still in shock that we haven't gotten past this. But again, we're going to keep fighting and trying to open the state. And I will share with you, and I've shared this with a few people, I am, I am the one attorney that I know of that has been working on something similar to what they did in Michigan. It has taken me seven weeks. I've been working on it myself. I've been financing it myself. I don't, I believe it's going to work, but we have some unique stuff here. And um, they just knew what they were doing here is all I'm going to say. They really knew what they were doing. They were bulletproof on how they did it. And there's been no um, hesitation or there's been no care. They haven't no conscience to say, you know what, maybe this is a little excessive. And that's the thing that really bothers me the most. When there's lack of leadership, leaders make adaptions. You make changes. I can't tell you how many fights I went into with this concrete battle plan. And like Mike Tyson says, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And so all of a sudden that strategy is not working. Well, you know, as well as I do, you got to change the strategy. Okay. So you change up your tactics. 
and they just never did it here. It's sad. Yeah. Well, Joey, I appreciate you being on number one with uh, real facts, real Corona facts. Uh, we're all fans. Get rid of the mask. I never shut down. Some people criticized me. They said, but you're not essential. I said, are you kidding? We're the ones going to help these businesses and people that have any financial or business question. Stay alive, be available. And uh, our team stayed together the whole time. And uh, we're still here. So we'll be fighting with you. Look forward to uh, meeting you in Reno soon. And those of you that are watching, again, be responsible. Make a conscious decision about what you want to do for you and your family. At the end of the day, you're the one making choices on how this economy and this volatility is going to affect you and your family. No matter what happens, you still got to have a plan and a strategy to walk through this. So stay tuned and stay in touch with us for more. And uh, many of you, you'll be watching this on social channels as well as our podcast. So thanks for listening. You've been uh, on uh, Laurel's Real Money Talks. If you have any questions, go to asklaurel.com, A-S-K-L-O-R-A-L.com. Make a request, uh, ask a question and uh, we'll have teams right back out to you. Have a great day. Joey, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, too. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Real Money Talks podcast. Your host has been Laurel Langmeyer, author of five New York Times bestsellers, money expert on Dr. Phil, CNN, CNBC, The Street TV, Fox News, and The View. Want to learn more about off-Wall Street investing, tax strategies, and multi-million dollar business strategies? Visit liveoutloud.com slash podcast for past episodes, show notes, and resources. For some special wealth building gifts only for Laurel's podcast listeners, visit liveoutloud.com slash podcast gifts. Do you have a burning question for Laurel? Visit asklaurel.com to submit your question, and it may just be covered on a podcast episode. So stay tuned and be sure to subscribe to get new episodes every week. Music.